Welcome in to other people's shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited about our guest today. I hope you brought your passport with you. Did you make it through customs okay? Did you get all the shoes in the proverbial suitcase? I don't even know what shoes we're wearing because we're down in a place we have yet to go. And that is South America. We were down in Argentina. Now, help me out with this a little bit. I think in Argentina, their national soccer team, believe it or not, I I think I know this. I'm pretty confident when I say this. They actually wear light blue on their jerseys. So we're feeling a little at home right now because we're in Argentina and they're wearing light blue. You guys know if you're a fan of the show, friend of the show, that's kind of our color scheme. Like it's our color brand. So I feel like we're on brand in Argentina. Help me welcome in my new friend, Rachel. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks, Neil. You got to help us because are you originally from there or where are you from originally? So I was born in New York and I grew up in South Florida, but my parents, my grandparents, and some of my great grandparents were born in Argentina. So we've been here for about a hundred years or more. And I live in a small town uh, in the mountains, or maybe it's a large town or small city, something like that. It's about 70,000 people. And it's nice here. It's nice here. I feel good here. Rachel, help us with this. What style of shoe do you like to wear? Sneakers. Okay. Well, actually, no, I, I need to, I need to take the I like to be barefoot, actually. You're a barefoot girl. Yeah. Okay. All right. So no shoes, yeah. no service, yeah. no problem. And if I had to put something on, I like, an, like a nice sandal. Yeah. Something pretty, but I love being barefoot. We love that. I can't get around people with bare feet. Ah, I had no? to put slippers on just to do this interview. I uh, I was walking around with bare feet and it was freaking me out. I was like, got to put some shoes on because my slippers look like shoes. Where do you live, Neil? Because I grew up in South Florida and my bare feet come from that. Come from it being so hot and the floor in the house being cool and walking around with bare feet. That's where it comes from. So I'm in Oregon, 25 miles from the California border. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. To help geographically yeah, on that. That's great. Yeah. We're really close. Like we could throw a rock and probably hit California. (laughs) What is the typical weather like down in Argentina? Like, is there a lot of rain? Is it more hot? Help me with that. No, there's, there isn't anything extreme. It isn't like the way it rains in Seattle or rains in London or anything. It's hot in the summer. It's cold in the winter. It's, it's pretty mild in both spring and fall. No, it's, it's pretty normal. There's nothing really that, that make, that would make it stand out. So being that you lived in the States for a long time, does it compare anything to the United States at all or or not so much? There are a lot of differences. There's a lack of organization here that I miss tremendously in the United States. If you call someone and they're going to come to your house, they give you a set date and time. And here they're just... They'll tell you they'll show up at nine and they show up at 1130 and just messes you up. You know, there's a there's a very relaxed and it, it happens, I think, also in the Caribbean and all over South America. I think it happens also in like Italy. There are some places where just punctuality and organization are not important things. So that takes a lot of getting used to. I've been here 16 years and I, I still don't get used to it. It still really, really bothers me. One thing is I, I have a 14 year old son and I've never been afraid to send him to school because the gun situation has it's it's not at all like it is in the United States and I'm comfortable sending him to school, sending him to the movies, sending him anywhere. I see what happens, what's happening in my country and it makes me very, very sad. That lack of control. Such an impactful statement to make that even in, we think of these countries outside of the United States that that are run so differently and we think, oh, it's better here in the States, but sometimes maybe it's not. I love that perspective, by the way. First off, I have to say I was in Ensenada many years ago, probably roughly 10 now. I remember the missionary that we were with, traveling with. Oh yeah, we're going to start this service at 12 o'clock, let's say. And I was like, cool. All right, 12 o'clock. Sounds great. We'll have everything ready. Our team will be ready. Everything will be good. And it was like 1245 by the time everyone rolled into the proverbial church that we were at. By the way, it was outdoors because it was really hot in Ensenada. And I remember looking at him going, these people are 45 minutes late. And he's like, Neil, you need to understand like in Latin culture, you're not late till you're at least an hour. And I was like, I need to move down here because I am repeatedly like 15, 20 minutes late to things. And people are like mad at me. They're like, Neil, that's so disrespectful. You don't care about my time. Yeah. And I'm incredibly punctual. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from the United States. And so I get mad at people here and they don't really get it. They're like, what? It's just a few minutes. I'm like, it's my time, damn it. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's my time. Honor my time. Well, let's <laughs> honor everyone else's time as the, as they've stopped by today to give you a listen and, and really hear more of your story. So to help, we are in this new season called Walk Away. Now, I got to be honest. When I started thinking about a walk away moment, I thought of walk off moments. I'm a sports guy, right? I thought about a walk on in, in college football, like the guy that's trying to earn his scholarship or the girl that's trying to earn her scholarship, a walk on athlete. But then the more I dug in, I thought, no, I bet you there's a lot of people out there that have had to walk away from a situation. Now, some may be good. Some may be, I had to leave a job. I had to leave a relationship. It was better for my health to walk away. Some have had a very traumatic event that have had a walk away moment. They've had to walk away from grief. They've had to walk away from just pain. So Rachel, I ask you this, what is your walk away moment? So my walkaway moment happened when I was about 21 and my parents separated. Not to really talk about, you know, them and their relationship. It was revealed that there was had been a lot of infidelity on on my father's part towards my mother. So I was angry and I told my dad that I didn't want to talk to him for a while. I wrote him a letter saying, I know what happened. I know what you've done. I'm really angry right now. Maybe we can talk when... I'm calmer or whatever. And my dad had not been a very good dad. My dad had been emotionally absent and unavailable, even though he lived in the house with us. It was mom, dad, my older sister, and myself. My dad wasn't close to, he didn't, what's the word? He wasn't invested in his family. He wasn't interested in spending time with us. No quality time, no, all of the ways that you see love can be given in the five love languages. If you're familiar with that, there was none of that going on. I started telling my mom when I was about 12 years old that I knew that dad didn't love me. I couldn't articulate why I didn't have the words at the age of 12 to understand or the probably the cognitive ability to to analyze him and where he was coming from but I knew I knew from his indifference I knew from his energy that he, he didn't love me more than just you know you're my daughter so I have to you know kind of way so when it was revealed that he had been unfaithful to my mom and I was so angry it was really easy to just say I don't want to talk to you right now for a while because there was really nothing that I was giving up there wasn't a relationship there to say I was walking away from like if he had been a really really bad husband, but a wonderful dad, that would have been terrible to me to love him as a dad, yet know that he had caused so much pain to my mom or whatever. When he read my letter, he let me know that we could have a relationship from this day forward, but he was not going to talk about the past. And that to me was unacceptable. In this rare display of self-love, I basically said that that wasn't good enough. My self-esteem was so low that, you know, three years later or two years later, I married my ex-husband who wasn't good for me, who was a toxic relationship. I married him because I felt unworthy and he was the first man to give me attention. But for some reason, I had the, I had the self-esteem and the self-love to say to my dad, you know what, what you have to give really isn't worth my time. I love better than you. I, I can do this better. And I'm not interested in someone giving me breadcrumbs. And for you to say, we're not going to talk about the past is, it's unacceptable. It's cowardly. So that was my walkaway moment. And that was 22 years ago. And I stand by it. In that 22 years since, the letter was written maybe a little longer and him reading it and him processing through and you saying, you know, hey, let, let's try to fix this in some respects, I would imagine, right? from him maybe in the early stages of of writing the letter you trying to maybe fix the relationship i mean that was the whole point of writing the letter i guess i would i would ask no, the letter basically said, I know what you've done. I'm really angry with you. I'll let you know when I'm ready to talk. And what he said was, when you're ready to talk, we're talking from this day forward. I'm not going to talk about the past. And that condition that he put, that was unacceptable. Because you wanted to really dig into the past and really get into the why of what happened. Well, I know now that I didn't have any right to ask him about him and my mom, because that's them. And I didn't know that as a 20 year old. I didn't really get that dynamic or that boundary that I would have been crossing. But I think I would have wanted to say to him, you know, you've been you've been emotionally absent for so long. What is it? I didn't even really know him. And what I knew, I didn't like. What I knew was someone who, I mean, he's conservative, and he's old fashioned, and he had two daughters who are progressive feminists. So I understand that he could have found it difficult to speak to us. I know that he would have preferred to have boys and not girls, which is also painful. Whenever he wasn't at work, he was on the soccer field coaching boys. There was like no way that he could connect with us. There was also no way that he ever tried. So if I was into, you know, theater and chorus and in, in high school, it's not like he ever gave any interest in that or in my sister's activities. So I felt like I was walking away from something that didn't even really exist, aside from on a biological level. Like this is the man who gave me half my DNA and I look like him and we have kind of the same sense of humor. We both like to sing. And there are certain things that I know come.
come from him. Aside from that, I couldn't say, and, and I this is what's going on, Neil, 22 years later. I don't feel like I missed out on anything, which to me is the even sadder part. I wish he I could talk to him. It's that I know that in this lifetime, I will not receive that love from a dad. It really has nothing to do with him specifically. It's just that I know that this is not something that I will ever get to live. I got to be candid here in this moment. I'm a dad. I'm a dad of a daughter. She's 15 years old now. Mm-hmm. I, I joke that she's 15 going on 25 because it, it feels like that some days. Emotionally, clothing, all of it, makeup, boys, piercings. I'm a guy. I, I don't get girl stuff. I'm just not wired that way. Sorry, not. Maybe projecting a little bit here. But I don't want my daughter, and again, yeah, I don't need to know how old you are here in this moment. I don't want my daughter 22 years from now to look back and go, well, dad didn't care. Dad didn't love. Dad didn't. I want to have that relationship with her. And you're saying and declaring very clearly, by the way, that, hey, I I didn't miss anything. I didn't want, I didn't need, you know, he was just there on a human level, human to human here. That's sad to me on a lot of levels because it's sad from the standpoint of saying, again, I'm, I'm not in a seat of judgment. I think you did on some level maybe miss something. No, when you live with when you live with someone who who isn't interested in spending time with you and who if you cry he walks right by you because he doesn't know what to do but never really tries to find out what to do. So I cried easily and I still do. He can't stand a woman crying and so he would walk out and let my mother deal with it or something. There is this I'm all about personal growth. Aside from my son, it's the most important thing in my life. He absolutely is not to the point where he wrote me an email a year and a half ago saying maybe it's time to heal old wounds from the past. I want you to know that I've forgiven myself. There's not a person that I tell that to that doesn't say, what? I'm sorry. Did he say I'm sorry? I said, no. He told me that he'd forgiven himself. I just don't have the time for that, Neil. I just don't. I, I think that it doesn't It doesn't matter to me. I, I don't think that blood is thicker than water. There are women who kill their children and there are fathers who rape their daughters. I don't think that blood is stronger than, than, than water. I think that no matter who you are, if you have a place in my, if for you to deserve a place in my life, there needs to be something that, I don't know, it just, it, it wasn't good enough. Whatever he gave wasn't good enough. And it was very little. It was, it was very little what he gave. It was breadcrumbs. And for me to accept that would, would lower myself in a way. It's recently that I finally done stepped away from sales and, and all of that profession. It's, it's out of my realm and what I want to do with the rest of my life. It's been fun. It's been great, but I can close that chapter. But before I close that chapter, I kind of read the, the last little lines of said chapter. And, and one of the things is that they really instilled in me in this last chapter of sales that I've been in is earn the right. And I joked with my area manager, I said, as I was, you know, leaving this, again, this role, I joked with her, I said, you know, I've learned a lot here from you and from, you know, the the current manager, you know, store manager. And she asked me, she said, well, if I can ask, what, what are you taking away? I said, earn the right. You have to earn the right. And she said, that's what you're taking away. Out of all the things, I said, yeah, yeah. That's the one. And she said, why? And I said, because it has so many applications. It doesn't just fit into sales. It fits into life. It fits into church. It fits into anything. It fits, you've earned the right or you haven't earned the right. And so I ask you this question. Your dad obviously never earned the right to be your dad. Exactly. Is there anything he could possibly do in this moment? Again, I don't know where this episode's going to go. I don't know who's going to listen. Somehow, some way, he gets a hold of this. Somebody gives it to him. Maybe he sees it on your social or whatever. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't follow you on social. I don't know. Aunt, uncle, somebody says, hey, you should check out Rachel. Like, listen to what she has to say. And he somehow listens to this. But you're declaring right now, he hasn't earned that right to be your dad. Is there anything he could possibly do to earn the right to be your dad again? And if so, how? If he forgave himself, what would he forgive himself for? He must know he did something wrong. He must know he was an indifferent, cold, unavailable father. So say that. I am so sorry that I was a cold, unavailable, indifferent father. And I will do better. I will, you know, whatever it is, when you apologize, when you give someone a second chance, I made a video about this just now for my YouTube. When you ask for for a second chance from anybody, from a partner who betrayed you, from a best friend who betrayed you, from anyone, the first step is a sincere apology. And then the promise to never do it again, to go to counseling, to get a spiritual advisor to, to help you out, you know, whatever it is that you look to, to do better. The thing is that, I mean, I've forgiven my father for being how he is. I have forgiven him for all his faults. 
I don't really want him in my life. It isn't about what could he do. It's just, we're just not really going to like each other. I think we're very different. And what is important to me is not important to him. I value communication and he does not. And I value personal growth and he does not. So I don't see it as, I think he's perfect the way he is. And I think I'm perfect the way I am. And in this life, we're just not going to like each other. I'm not saying that I'm the good guy and he's a bad guy. I'm saying that just I'm okay and he's okay. And we're just not going to be together. But again, I go back to it's just a, it's a sad thing. It is a sad thing. Again, I, I can think of relationships that I've had. My my, mm-hmm. my own father being one of them. Emotionally was not there. Like, I mean, you talk about yeah. the proverbial emotional bank, right? I was in a lot of respects of bankrupt or very low balance as a child, not having him there. You know, a lot of that had to do with his career. He chose to be a United States Marine. So they're gone a lot. Right. I mean, that's just the, the nature of the job. But in that, Like of late, we've done our very best to put aside whatever junk has been in the past. Now, is it forgotten? Is it not spoken of? No, we we have spoken of it. We've talked about it. We've shared, hey, this really sucked when that happened. Hey, this was really bad when that happened. Hey, I didn't respond the best here, whatever it may be. But in those moments, like I said, we've had to stop and say, okay, where are we going to go from here? What can we build on from here? Right. But that's excellent. That's communication. And what I'm hearing you say is there is no foundation. This is this is ashes. There's nothing here that can be built upon. Right. So I know these two actors, Dax Shepard and Jake Johnson, and they've both spoken in different interviews about how their fathers were dealing with addiction. Their fathers abandoned them as children. They were dealing with addiction when they were in recovery. They had the courage to come back. They had the humility to come back and win their children over. Boys were now men. They were angry. And both of these fathers did everything they had to do. They apologized. They showed up. They kept their promises. When they made a promise, they kept them. They showed an emotional maturity or a desire to grow, a desire to learn how do we communicate, how we can have an uncomfortable conversation that is amazing and that is wonderful. And that those are those are the times that I say, yes, absolutely. Give your father a second chance. He's showing you all the things that he has to show you to be in your life. Until that happens, there's really nothing to talk about. If you and your father, even though you fight, there is communication and you can say, well, I really didn't like it when you did that. There is an attempt to understand the other person. Imagine if these men of these actors that come back and said, I've forgiven myself. Let's start over. That's insane. There is no accountability there. I'm I'm getting angry. (laughs) I have family members who were sexually abused by their dad and he's now passed. The dad has now passed. And even though that horrific thing happened to them, I, I think it's, I think it's equal on both sides, male and female, but they have chosen to forgive their dad before he died for the record. And in that, they also chose, though, to put boundaries up, to stay away, to say, yes, I forgive you, but you're not in my life. Like, I'm not I'm not letting you in the door. Sorry, not happening. There is some boundaries that need to be set forth. And rightfully so. I think others would would echo that and say, yeah, that that seems to make sense. Absolutely. Well, a lot of what you do and a lot of your platform and a lot of what you're about is coaching is trying to help others get past some of these pains, some of these weeds in our lives, some of these like hard moments, tough ground. But there's this statement that I came across across. And I think, I think this might just resonate with you just a little bit, just maybe a little bit. It says you can choose to change or you can choose to remain in the same place. Either way, it's a choice. You got that from my website. (laughs) I did indeed. Yes, I did. That's why I thought you might find that familiar. Of course. Where does that come from? Like, where does that mindset, where does that thought process come from? So that comes from speaking to a lot of women, uh, fatherless daughters. So you can be fatherless in several different ways. I work with women whose fathers were either physically absent or emotionally absent, kind of like mine, my, like my own story. I find a lot of women, unfortunately, are content to stay angry and they don't understand why nothing changes in their lives. And I think there's, I talk to women about victimhood and empowerment and how to go from being a victim to being empowered, you need to make a change. You need to decide to stop being angry. You need to decide to forgive which is very scary for some people because they don't really understand what forgiveness is and they're seeing it as being okay with what was done. And so to me, change is absolutely a choice. It's looking at my life. Do I like the way it is? And what I don't like, well, then I need to change it. Even though change is scary, if you're tired of being angry at your dad or being sad about it, you need to change your thoughts. You need to change what is, whatever it is that you're doing. You need to change All it. All right. So I was curious about this because I'm always curious what words really mean. Like, are we using them the right way? I have a bad, really, 
the bad habit of using words the wrong way. Okay. I think I know what they mean. And Princess Bride, like, I don't think you know what that means. That is you my know, favorite I, I movie ever. Probably messed that line up. I don't think you think what that means. Yeah. So whatever he says there, I'm messing that up again. But I looked up the word forgiveness and it says the act or progress. So there has to be progress. The act or progress of forgiving or being forgiven. I feel like that's a really absolutely lame definition. A sense to feel resentment against the offender. They also have this, the act of granting relief from a payment, forgiveness. So there you go. Some forgiveness definitions. Definition for forgiveness, and I have one for acceptance, and I have one for letting go. Because when you do this kind of work, you need to get really familiar with all three and the differences between them. So my definition for forgiveness is it's a conscious and deliberate choice there's a choice to stop feeling angry, resentful, and or vengeful toward the person or circumstance that has hurt you. It's choosing to stop feeling bad. Acceptance would be the conscious choice to not resist whatever has happened and deciding to make the most of it. And letting go is releasing the emotional baggage of your pain and the expectation that things could have been different. I agree with those. I think I have this theory, but I'm not sure it's it's I'm not sure it's right. I think people are confused about forgiveness because of the way it's phrased, because we say, I forgive you. And and so it sounds like something that I'm bestowing upon you, like a grace that I am giving to you. And people don't realize that it's for themselves, that it's to free yourself of the pain, the hurt, the desire for vengeance, the resentment, all of that. And so I always wonder if I thought, I wonder if it has something to do with the way it's phrased. So what do you do with that, the way it's phrased? You teach people that, I mean, that's just, I don't even know how it is in other languages. In Spanish, it's also phrased like that. It's the perdono. Like, I do this for you. And you're not doing it for anybody. You're doing it, you're not doing it for the other person. You're doing it for yourself. More people need to understand what that means. And I also see a lot of people, but this is all about the, the victim mindset. This is all about someone being really, really loving their anger and really wanting to be a victim because they're obviously getting something out of it. They're getting attention. They're getting a sense of justice or self-righteousness. I saw I'll tell people all the time, people have forgiven the Holocaust. You know, Nelson Mandela forgave his, the prison guards. People have forgiven very, very big things. When you think of it like that, I thought, oh, of course I can forgive my dad. You know, he's he's human. He's not, he's he's perfect the way he is. And, and I shouldn't try to, to change him. I just have to see if how he is fits with what I want in my life. One of my favorite songs, it's, it's in the top 50. The song by Matthew Weston is called, ironically enough, Forgiveness. And so one of the lyrics of the song or part of the lyrics say this, it says, it clears away the bitterness. It can even set a prisoner free. There's no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through your eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really frees is you. Mm -hmm. I agree with all of that. What do you make of that? I agree with all of that. I don't know that song, but I agree with all of it. I love talking about forgiveness. It's amazing how many people run away from it. They're they're scared of it or they, yeah, I hear a lot. I'll forgive when they apologize. You can forgive anyway. I think forgiveness is an amazing thing. My favorite quote is about forgiveness. It's by Mark Twain. And it says something like, forgiveness is the violet release, the the fragrance the violet releases on the heel that has crushed it or something like that. It's really beautiful and, and very, it conjures up something very visual. I love the idea that we can look at ourselves as imperfect people who all need forgiveness for what they've done. But you do have, you have a choice on who you allow into your life. Then, you know, that was why I walked away. I heard Jan Le Van Sant say years after this that you don't get to decide how someone loves you. You just get to observe how they love and decide if you want to participate. So what I did was I saw what my father had to give and I said, no, thanks. I did that for my ex-husband, too. I did that for maybe a friend that I'm no longer friends with. I mean, we do this all the time. We, re we, we recognize when a job is no longer for us. Like you said in the beginning, walking away can be really really beneficial to us. As sad as it is that I walked away from my dad, it was beneficial to me. So I'm going to help you with your Mark Twain quote. So okay. Mark Twain said this, or is at least credited to saying this? I have to always have that as the caveat. We don't know right, for right, sure because, right. you know, it's the internet. Who knows? Mark Twain is credited for saying this. It says, forgiveness is the fragrance the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Yeah, love it. I think I'm just really struggling with this idea that forgiveness is great. You're saying it. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Like, we need it. It's drinking poison, somehow thinking it affects the other person. Cliche. Throw it on an Instagram post. Put it on a T-shirt. Yeah. Put it on a bumper sticker. It's fantastic. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. But the hardest person to forgive in your life has been who? Probably myself. Uh, the lack of love that I received from my dad got me to marry a man who was toxic and abusive. And 
And after 10 years, I left him. And when I decided to do this work of forgiving, because I really wanted to be in a better space, I wanted to manifest better things. I knew that I was going to attract things into my life and I didn't want to attract the same kind of man. I realized I need to forgive my dad for what he didn't give me. I need to forgive my ex-husband for things that he did. And I need to forgive myself for having allowed a lot of things to be done to me that had I loved myself well, I would have said no to. So a lot of it is looking back at myself. Oh my God, the pictures of my wedding. I look back at that and I look at that 24 year old and I think, oh, you poor thing. You had no idea, did you? And there's embarrassment in that and there's shame in that and, and all of these like really horrible emotions that don't help us in any way. And that that was probably, that's the hardest one, I think, was to be okay with with the things that I did wrong. Why do you have to be okay with them? Well, because it's part of loving myself. It's part of accepting myself as I am. If I did wrong to go and apologize to someone or to do better, whether it's me or someone else, but to see yourself committing errors, you know, in hindsight, when you, if you can look back when, you know, I'm 44 now and I look back 20 years ago when I got married and, and I look at that girl and I'm, I'm like embarrassed for her in many ways. And then I have to remind myself, no, she, she was doing what she thought was great. She was choosing this man that she loved at the moment and, and it's okay. Yeah, I think it is okay. I think as long as I respect people who, I respect people a lot who love personal growth, who are open about it, who share it. I think people who basically say there's nothing for me to learn or I'm, I don't respect that very much. So if somebody's listening right now yeah, and they're like, you know, Rachel, Argentina, Seems fun. <laughs> Seems like a fun little town. Great noises in the background. It's been a lot of bustle and hustle and fun stuff. But if they're hearing you right now and they're thinking of that one person in their life that they're like, no, not that one. But if you were to point into somebody's life, that person that they don't want to talk about, that situation that is just untouchable, nobody has broken through that wall and they're battling this forgiveness battle. I've been there. There's a few that have been on that list for me that I'm like, nope, never, uh-uh, sorry, not happening. What would you say to that person right now that maybe is struggling with that idea of forgiving, that idea of walking away maybe from that relationship? Because sometimes, like I said, sometimes we have to walk away to get healing and then maybe come back and restore in some respects. But what would you say to that person right now that maybe has that person on their mind? They're like, no, I, I can't. I don't care what Rachel says. I can't. I can't can't do it. I think forgiveness happens in many layers. I think healing does too. I think there are times that you forgive someone maybe seven years ago by myself on like a four day spiritual retreat. And I did a lot of work and I cried and I wrote to my dad and stuff. And then, and that was, you know, one layer of healing. And then there were others. And now it's just like, it's all over. It's, it's fine. It's done. I think that I can't know this person's situation. The thing that I say all the time, it's my tagline. And, and I say it on my videos is that your love for yourself is more important than your father's love for you. But you can say that about anybody. You can say it about you can say it about your partner. You can say it about your parents. You can say it about your children. You were, you know, you were born alone. You're gonna die alone. You're just with you. Truly, you're just with you. You can't leave yourself. So the healthier you can be, the better for you, for the planet, because we're all sharing energy. We're all bumping up against each other's energy, creating this one macro energy. So if you're that defiant and that steadfast in, I will not forgive, just know that it is hurting you. My hope for anybody is that they would want themselves to be as healthy as they could possibly be. Anger and bitterness and resentment, they really are toxic emotions. They're toxic emotions if you don't do anything about them. If you let them, if you sit in it, if you marinate in it, if you let it fester, that's when it becomes toxic. And if you really, really feel like you can't forgive, there are examples of really catastrophic things happening in the world to people and people forgiving them. So if it really feels hard, maybe you can draw inspiration from someone else, from something bigger. I mentioned the Holocaust because I happen to be Jewish. I know about the Holocaust. I, you know, I learned about it when I was, you know, all, all my life, really. And I am amazed sometimes that people could forgive those things. But they had to. They had to in order to survive. In order to create a life, a new life after that, they had to put that down. They had to leave it down and, and take steps forward. So I want to make sure I heard the line correctly. Your love for yourself is more important than your father's love for you. Because people are think are concentrating on what did he not give me? What did he not do for me? And what I ask is, what are you doing for you? What have you done for you? Stop thinking about him out there and come back to you. Your love for you is more important than your father's love for you. Your love for yourself is more important than your father's love. So here's where I'm at. As I hear that back, obviously, I'm all about the perspective. I'm all about your shoes, what, we, what you're about. We're all about that. And here's my question, being a person of faith, and maybe this is where, where it gets a little different, where the road maybe splits a little bit, but being a person of faith that I am, I put a lot of my belief, my love, my adoration, my worship 
in a heavenly father, Jehovah, God the provider, does that affect you in any way as far as your relationship with your earthly father? I also have a lot of faith, but I'm not, I don't ascribe to any religion, even the one that I was born into, which is Judaism. Nothing wrong with it. I just prefer my spirituality to not come with rules. This is forbidden and this is not and, and, and all that stuff. I just have my relationship with God and, and I like it. I happen to believe in the soul. I believe that the soul go, goes on to the other side. And I think that the soul is better than the human personality because it lacks the ego. I believe that when we're born, we're given our ego and our personality. And that is what keeps us apart from each other. That is what makes us scared to have an uncomfortable conversation. Speaking for my dad, his ego is keeping him away from me. It's keeping him scared. On the other side, I imagine we'd get along maybe pretty well because we will be devoid of that. So my spiritual my spirituality tells me that I do my best here on earth to evolve as much as I can, for my soul to grow as much as it can. I don't worry about the rest because I think everyone is in that same position. All of us are trying to grow. Some of us do it with religion. Some of us don't. And it's okay. Like I said before, I really, I really respect people who are into personal growth, who are into evolving themselves and being better. I have great respect for it. Yeah, I guess I would ask you, what would your, what does your faith tell you to do on this life then? That's a great question. And so I'll answer that for sure. And, and this has been truly my struggle too. And that's why I think so much of what you're saying is resonating with me at least is I think on some level, we all want, and maybe you don't, maybe you're the exception. So I'm going to just have that as the caveat. On some level, I think most people want a father figure kind of guide, kind of protector, kind of, you know, somebody to to be there. Like I'm imagining a little boy or a little girl crawling up in daddy's lap and hearing amazing stories of the day. And, and they don't even have to be, sure. you know, tall tales of Paul Bunyan and, and Johnny Appleseed or amazing yeah, stories yeah, yeah. from Abraham Lincoln. They can even be Disney stories for, for all I care. But I think of so many songs. I mean, the, there's a, there's another song out there that I'm thinking of that, you know, one of my favorite Christian artists sings. It's, it's called Cinderella by Stephen Curtis Chapman. It's an amazing song. There's Butterfly Kisses by Bob Carlisle, and I'm probably getting his name wrong, but you know that one. there's so many of these mm -hmm. amazing kind of father figure songs. And then there's a worship song by Chris Tomlin. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. These are songs as you're talking about your dad and talking about forgiveness and talking about all these things that, yeah, I think when I think of the God of the Bible, the one that I most worship, the God that I have put my faith and trust and in, in life into, mm -hmm. it's a struggle for me sometimes too, because again, I look at my earthly father, I'm like, well, if God's anything like my earthly father, I want nothing to do with him. And I think you would echo that. And so for me, it's hard when I hear that, when I get pushed up against that, because like, man, I have struggled with God, the father being my father. I can acknowledge him as my creator. Like, Hey, that's how, that's how I was made. Awesome. That's how amazing things have been made. Like the penguin and Antarctica and cool places like that and amazing sunsets that he's painted and put the stars in the sky. I can, I can acknowledge him as the creator, but the hard part is, is when I talk about that father relationships, that Abba father, that, that Papa, that's when it gets hard. That's when it really gets really, really hard. Because again, I feel like I, I put on those earthly glasses and I think of my God, like my dad. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if I can really lean into that. I don't know if that answered anything or if that made it more muddy. I, I don't know. I think it made it more muddy. <laughs> I, I guess to make that all to say, it's really hard for me sometimes to acknowledge God as my father. Right. The reason why I don't accept God of the Bible as God, to me, God is a lot better than that God, because the God of the Bible is full of human qualities. He's jealous. He's vengeful. And he's he's so, it's like, I, I, I believe that the Bible was written by man because they made God just like them, just more powerful. My God is so beyond that. You think of like the creator of the universe, really the creator of the universe is going to be that. We follow the Old Testament, the part where God asks, I think, Abraham to sacrifice his son to show his love. That is barbaric. That is a psychological torture. You would not do that to anybody. Imagine saying to your daughter, you need to prove how much you love me. So you're going to do it 
it by killing your dog, your cat, whatever you most love. And then I will know. And then at the last moment you say, no, 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 it's okay. I hear you. I can't believe in that God. You know, it's, it's basically a very powerful man with these qualities that are just, I, I don't know. The, the God that I believe in is, has nothing to do with that. Well, and I think that's the best part about what I get to do each and every week. It's the idea that you and I don't have to agree, which is okay. You know, you and I right. don't have to have right. the same theological background and, and idea right. and all of this. Right. No, I was offering it up as a kind of maybe you struggle with your heavenly father because he's so much like a human because he was written as so much like a human and what you want is to believe that he is above and beyond all of those things one of the ten commandments is that shall not kill god kills a lot in the bible god kills many many people in the bible so you know i just i can't square my idea of infinite love and forgiveness the god of the bible i wouldn't want him as my father at all it seems pretty mean. Well, I think that's why I come back to the idea, which again, I don't have answers for all that. And we probably don't have time for all those answers, even if I were to give some. I will say this, that for me, when I come back to the Bible and I come back to God of the Bible, I come back to something in the that's in Isaiah. Now, again, I, I put a lot of stock in what the Bible says. Again, that's me. That's not you. Yeah. I'm not putting that on anyone. That's fine. I'm loving this conversation. But in that, I would say, you know, Isaiah talks about his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. And so I have to cling to that in this moment to say, listen, I don't understand a lot of the Old Testament. I don't get a lot of what happened. But I will say his thoughts, again, are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. I can't understand them. I can't understand what he thought. I don't understand. I, I would love to get the DVD version when I get up there, God willing, that I get to heaven to, to find out more or to ask him the question like, okay, explain to me the flood. Explain sure. to me the genocide. Explain right. to me, you know, why this happened. Explain to me Abraham and Isaac, you know, explain to me that. I need to know. I'm sure we'll know more, but that's where I I'm get at. It. With all that aside, yeah. so Rachel, I want to give you an opportunity though right now. Like again, if somebody's hearing you, you're resonating with some hearts right now. Now, what's the best way somebody can reach out to you and connect with you? So you can find me on my website. It is healsinglove.com. My email is rachel at healsinglove.com. I help women who had emotionally absent fathers or physically absent fathers. We help you with that. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you want to get on my email list, you can find that on my website also. Awesome. So that's cool. Well, Rachel, thanks so much for coming in. At the end of the show, it's called Senseless. It's kind of just this silly, really just senseless humor on my part. And it's these five questions that involve our senses. And then six is the wild card because I have been told that apparently we have a sixth sense. I don't know. I saw the movie. I've never seen dead people. <laughs> Maybe it's a really lame joke to share. So here we go. Senseless, I'm going to roll for you. Now, I know, you know, I know in Argentina, we haven't maybe reached out far enough in our Tar Heel fandom to get to Argentina, but I did kind of lead off with the fact that you guys like light blue down there. That is the official color of Argentina. It's the color of the flag, light blue and white, that sky blue and white. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I would be right at home in Argentina, like I said, with all my light blue fandom. Sure. Sure. Love it. Sure. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to roll for you because you're still in Argentina, not in Oregon. All right, here we go. And you got this number right here, which is number number five. I picked it up backwards. Okay. It's a backwards five, which is this. Question number five is this. Something you taste that you always seem to get a reaction to. Chocolate chip cookies. Okay. Maybe it goes without saying, but why? It's just joy. It's yummy. It's yummy joy. <laughs> Yummy joy. All right. We're quoting you as yummy joy. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, just want to say thank you so much for listening. Appreciate that. Now, here's the thing that I love that you should also equally love. I love the fact that there's different definitions of things. Now, who has the right definition? That's that's maybe the question to ask yourself right now in this moment. Do I have the right definition? Does Rachel have the right definition? Should we really forgive? Should we really allow dads in our lives if they've been mean and toxic? That's a great question to ask yourself right now. So I'm going to ask you this question because, you know, it's always fun to ask questions, right? That's what I love to do. It's kind of my hobby. How's your relationship with your dad? Where's it at? Take a moment right now. Just kind of survey the room. Is it good? Is it great? Could it be better? Do you want to even make it better? Now, I know for some of you, maybe you don't even have a dad. Like dad's gone. Rest in peace. He is past, long past. I have a very good friend that her dad passed shortly after we got out of high school. And I remember how devastating that was. I remember how sad she was. She's never going to hear, I love you from her dad ever again. Very sad. But I want to challenge you in this moment right now. What does that relationship look like for you? What does your relationship look like with your dad? 
And if it's, again, if it's toxic, I don't know. I'm not trying to tell you to go fix something that's maybe toxic, but just take a moment right now and pause and say, where's it at? And if it's bad, if it's good, if it's whatever, let me know. I'd love to hear. OPSpodcast.com. You can, of course, let us know there. You can also let us know on our social medias, OPS Podcast Show. A little different on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can let us know there. But I want you to remember this. Don't don't forget. Don't just, you know, fast forward past because it's almost over. Remember this. Don't ever forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.